Hi, I'm Mary Hardy. Today I'm presenting the second instalment in a series of three short videos on the market valuation of cash balance pension benefits. In this instalment, we're going to cover three items. We're going to outline the valuation formula, which was behind the results that we showed in the first uh, video. We're going to expand those results and look at different retirement horizons, and then we're going to make some comments on those uh, results that we find. So first of all, we need some notation to develop the valuation formulas. So we're going to let FT denote the participant's fund at T. Remember, this is a notional fund. So this is the accumulated uh, contributions uh, under the cash balance scheme regulations. The contributions are accumulated at a crediting rate. We're going to denote that by our upper C at T. So at time T, we know what the crediting rate is. But before time t, that, was, that will generally be a random variable. We're going to use uh, the yield curve. So rkt denotes the spot rate, uh, the k-year spot rate from the yield curve at time t. And again, at time t, we can observe that. Before time t, that's going to be a random variable. Uh, and rt is the short rate at t. So the short rate you can interpret as an annualized overnight rate, for example. And RT is the fundamental building block of interest rate models. Using RT or using RKT, we can calculate uh, zero coupon bond prices. So P, TT plus K denotes the price at time T of a K year zero coupon bond. And that works as a discount factor uh, in discounting future payments from T plus K back to T. And again, at time T, this is observable, but before time t, this is a random variable. Our ultimate goal is the valuation factor vt, and that is the market value of the cash balance benefit, including the guaranteed accumulation at the crediting rate, where we're considering a t-year horizon, big t-year horizon to retirement. So if the market value, for example, if vt is equal to 1, then the market value of the fund of the, of the benefit is exactly equal to the participant's fund uh, at time t. So that's our, vt is our objective. Before that, we need to recall some results from yield curve mathematics. So the price of the zero coupon bond, we can find that in two different ways. We can find it from the k-year spot rate at time t. So it's simply equal to the zero coupon bond price here is equal to e to the minus k times r subscript kt. All of these rates are continuous rates. So rk, r, and rc, we're treating each of them as continuous rates. We also know from the financial valuation principles of no arbitrage that the zero coupon bond price, same, same left-hand side here, is equal to the expected value at time t. Well, that's what this subscript means. It means given all the information we have at time t of the uh, stochastic discount factor, which is this part. So we discount e to the minus integral of the short rate. So the expected value uh, of the stochastic future discount factor, e to the minus short rates, is equal to the actual value of the zero coupon bond uh, for k years. And that is a, a, there's a no arbitrage argument. The Q in this expectation says that we're using a risk-neutral uh, valuation measure here. So, putting that together, assuming that we're given uh, the, the F0, which is the notional uh, policy hold, sorry, notional participant fund at time zero, we can calculate the projected fund at time t, this is a random variable, by taking the fund at time zero and accumulating at the crediting rate. This, is the, this part here is the accumulation factor. And we're, accumulate, we're assuming that the crediting rate applies continuously. That's an approximation. They apply discreetly, but it's not a terrible approximation. So our valuation factor, what do we want to do with the valuation? We want to take the future, the random future value of the fund, which is F big T, and discount it back to time zero. So this F 
subscript T is a random, value, random variable representing the future value of the fund in T years. And the discount factor under financial valuation principles is we discount at the uh, short rate by integrating over the future short rates. And we're conditioning on F0 being equal to 1 because the valuation factor is per dollar of policyholder fund. So we, don't, we can just scale up for other values. So both of these two terms, FT and the discount function here, are random variables and they're dependent random variables. So we can't separate them out. We have to look at them jointly. If we substitute for FT our accumulation in the crediting rate, then we multiply that by the discount factor and we get the final result here, which is our fundamental valuation formula, that the valuation factor at time for a t-year horizon at time zero uh, is e to the integral, and we're going to integrate the difference between the crediting rate and the short rate. So it's this difference that is going to be the key factor in the valuation. So there are a couple of simple cases uh, that we'll cover first, where we don't need to make any more assumptions. The first one is, suppose that the crediting rate isn't a random variable, suppose it's a constant, uh, and that's a relatively common plan design in, for cash balance plans. In that case, uh, in the valuation formula, we can uh, extract the RC term, we no longer need to put that in the expectation because it's not random, and we end up with um, a factor in our constant RC, and a discount factor in uh, the short rate. But we already know what that discount factor is. That's just the zero coupon bond price for a T-year zero coupon bond. And that is observable at time zero. So there's nothing, there's no calculation, there's no randomness. This valuation is simply taken by uh, multiplying um, the T-year accumulation at the, at the uh, fixed crediting rate by the price of a zero coupon bond at time T. So, for example, if we have a 5% fixed crediting rate, so e to the RC is, is 1.05, and using the yield curve, US yield curve, at 1st of April 2013, um, if we have a 20-year horizon, we find that the valuation factor is 1.56. And recall that what that means is for every $1 in the fund, in the, in the participant's notional fund, the market value of each $1 is $1.56. And for every $1 contributed to the fund as, a, as this year's contribution, the, the market value of that contribution is $1.56. It's somewhat uh, cheaper, and you can immediately see this from the calculations, uh, as if your horizon is shorter. So at five years, the market value is $1.22. We say that there's a premium in this case of of 22.85% over the notional participant fund. We haven't had to make any assumptions to, to get this result. There's an, one more case where we don't need any more assumptions, and that is when the crediting rate is derived from the short rate. So if the crediting rate is the short rate, the overnight rate, plus some fixed margin, then we can uh, we can achieve another model-free result. So in this case, if the crediting rate is equal to the short rate plus a margin, then when we put that in our fundamental valuation formula, the short rates cancel out. And all we're left with is e to the margin times our horizon. Now, it is not common for the crediting rate to be based on the overnight rate, but it is a, uh, a, a design that you do see in practice that the crediting rate might be based on three month or six month rates and that would be very similar. The results would be very close to this because the short rate and the three month rate will be close. So for example, if you use a three month rate then you might use a margin of 175 basis points in which case your valuation factor with a five year horizon to retirement would be uh, 1.09 and with a 20-year horizon to retirement would be about 1.42. Again, a model-free result. We haven't had to do, we haven't had to make any further assumptions. This is all looking at market values using market yields. 
But what about all the other cases? So there are the most common cash balance design is, is not based on very short rates uh, and isn't based on fixed rates. It's based on uh, longer term yields. So if you credit with, a, say, a K, or say a 30-year uh, yield on treasuries, then we need to use a model because we need to model to represent the relationship between the 30-year rate and the, sh spot and the short rate. Um, if instead of looking at the yield to maturity on a 30-year bond, we look at 30-year spot rates, we can derive an, uh, a f uh, an analytic result for the valuation, which is quick and efficient. So we've done that, uh, and then uh, we've looked at the relationship at how that inaccuracy, that estimation going from a yield to maturity to the spot rate uh, impacts the accuracy. So if we use the 30-year spot rates or a K-year spot rate, that says the crediting rate is equal to the spot rate plus some margin. And we use a one-factor Hull-White model. Uh, we've tried several models and the results are pretty similar. So we're just presenting this one. The advantage of the, this model is that the zero it comes from here. The zero coupon bond price um, is e to the a minus b times r. And although this a and b look complicated, in fact, they're simple, f relatively simple functions of the model parameters and the starting yield curve. They don't involve r. So this, the log of the zero coupon bond price is a linear function of the short rate. So b is actually a relatively simple function uh, that depends only on the term of the zero coupon bond price and uh, the parameter a from the Hull-White model. And a is a slightly more complicated mo um, function that depends on the starting yield curve and on the parameters of the model. So just playing around with the Hull-White model for a, a slide or two, so the zero coupon bond price we can express in two ways. We can express it as uh, the discounted uh, e to the minus k times the spot rate, and we can express it as e to the a minus b times r. And so that gives us a relationship between the spot rate rk, the k-year spot rate, and the short rate r in terms of these functions. And when we substitute that into our fundamental valuation formula, so this part, remember, is our crediting rate, and this part is the short rate. We put everything in terms of the short rate in this, uh, in this rearrangement, and that allows us to get an analytic result. So we separate all the terms in the short rate. We'll just use gamma to represent this function that turns up a bit. And we have this result for k-year spot rates based on the whole white model. And in fact, based on any affine model would be very similar. We have similar results. Uh, so the first term is e to the mt, where m is the margin over the spot rate um, used for the crediting rate. This next term is uh, e to the minus integral a over k. Uh, we can calculate that very accurately using numerical integration. And the final term, which is a expected value of e to the minus this constant gamma times RT, we can get an analytic, analytic solution for. So we can easily and swiftly, we don't need to use simulation or anything like that, uh, calculate numbers for any given parameters and starting yield curve. So that's what we'll do. So here's a table of results, and uh, I'll just pick out some highlights. Um, the, the, for the 2013 first of April yield curve, these are the valuation factors. So the first column is for looking at a five-year horizon, uh, and the last column looking at a 20-year horizon to retirement, the middle column looking at a 10-year horizon. All of these rows down to here are, are using the Hull-White model, these last two rows are the model-free results that we presented earlier. Uh, what you can see is all these numbers are bigger than one. What that means is it is never justified based on these parameters and these, this yield curve uh, to assume that you, the value of your cash balance benefit is less than the participant's count based on a market value basis, um, not based on this yield curve. However, as we mentioned in the last talk, uh, the results are dependent on the yield curve, so let's see how this varies over, uh, over the history of yield curves back to the earlier days of cash balance plans. In fact, this 
graph is, a, is a similar to one that I showed at the end of the first presentation. Um, and this, so this just shows the, uh, a, f a subset of the crediting rate. So the, the black line here is the 30-year rate. Very volatile, but uh, never running. The, the lowest value in, in 2000 is about 1.1. Uh, uh, the value in 2013 is, is nearly 1.4. The green line shows the results for a crediting rate based on five-year spot rates with a margin of 25 basis points. It's another relatively common plan design. It's much more stable than the 30-year rates. More stable still, but higher, uh, is the blue line, which shows the one-year, the results using crediting rate based on one-year uh, 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 spot rates plus a 1% margin. And then the magenta line that runs through um, is the other results based on the 5% fixed crediting rate. So we, I showed this and discussed this a bit in the first uh, presentation. What happens if we reduce the, the horizon that we're looking at? So if we don't have 20 years to retirement, uh, but 10, five years. So based on the same scaling, this is the graph for 10 years, which shows that there's a lot less volatility and the results are all a bit lower based on tenure, you'd expect that. But still, we have substantial valuation premiums, that is the difference between the valuation factor and the 1%. And uh, with 5%, you have the same sort of effect. The values are slightly lower um, uh, and slightly less volatile, but still quite a lot of variation. If you were projecting all of the benefits to retirement on a market consistent basis um, based on a, a large fund with a range of uh, dates to retirement, the, the valuation factor for um, participants who will retire imminently will be close to one. The valuation factors for participants 20 years from retirement will, we've shown you could be 1.2 to 1.4 depending on your crediting rate. And the overall valuation factor will be some uh, weighted average of these. So a few comments. We mentioned last time, and you see again here, that the most volatile results come from the least volatile crediting rates. The 30-year rate, the fixed 5% rate, give the most volatile results. The 1%, if you credit at one, uh, sorry, the one-year rate, crediting the one-year rate or the very short rate, your credit, the, the actual crediting rates are very volatile, and yet the valuation factors are very stable. And this, this fundamental valuation formula explains why that is. This shows you that the risk is coming from, not from the crediting rate itself, but from the difference between the crediting rate and the short-term rate. So if you're crediting using very long rates, your risk is coming from the spread from the short to the long rates. And the spread from short to long is going to be more volatile than the spread from short to less short. And that explains why the 30-year crediting rate is probably not, going forwards, a good design choice. But even a five-year rate uh, uh, turns out to be costly. A one-year rate, using the standard margin of 100 basis points, is stable, but it's expensive, uh, considering that um, uh, the, if, if the objective is to create a, a benefit where the valuation is close to the uh, sum of the, of the participant accounts, you're not going to do that with a one-year one crediting rate plus 100 basis points because that 100 basis points margin is what makes that expensive. So some caveats that I'm, I mentioned a few of these along the way. The actual crediting rates are based on par yields, not spot rates, but the results are re relatively close. There's model and parameter risk, and we've explored both of those in the accompanying paper, which you can, uh, which you can download from the SOA research web pages under pension research. We've assumed no exits, but as I mentioned, you can easily accommodate exits by taking a weighted average of the different horizon times. Um, and we've assumed no allowance for credit risk, so the market valuation can be adjusted to reflect the default risk of the plan sponsor, but it's, it's common not to allow for that. In the third uh, installment, third and final installment, we will look at um, other approaches to market consistent valuation based on different definitions of the accrued benefit. 
Uh, and uh, I'd like to just finish with some acknowledgements of uh, various agencies that have supported uh, this uh, research and uh, the programs of actuarial science at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and also my two co-authors, David Saunders and Mike Drew. Thank you.